So uh, I'm going to speak English. Everybody capable of understanding that language? What if they can't read it? Who, who doesn't understand? Uh, yeah, that's fine. If you understand English, then who understands English? Great. So you actually are awake, and you are hearing me talk. So cool. <coughs> so my name is Toby Utterson. I'm going to uh, be your presenter teacher for this morning in uh, the RD2 workshop. And we're going to do two things mainly. I'm, I'm going to do a little performance up here uh, explaining to you how RD2 works and uh, how you can do graphs and stuff. And then I also have a rather long series of exercises you can solve to also learn RD2. Um, both items could take the whole class, but they can't happen at the same time. So I'll uh, try to get, depending on your uh, involvement, how many questions you have and, and how well you play. <laughs> also, if you're bored, you could start solving the exercises while I'm talking. Um, <coughs> all the stuff I'm going to present today is on here. Can you read that or not? Probably not. Okay, I'll copy that. <coughs> I brought the best free version of the exercises. It's a double-sided with four sheets, and the other one is eight sheets. <coughs> <coughs> so on these workstations, uh, there's uh, an installation which is um, local, and it's it may be destroyed. So you, you have a route request if you want to using CD. So if something's missing or should be changed, you can change it. Um, RD tool is installed, so if you do the exercises, you can do that on that local, so you can use the laptop as well. Um, we'll see how that goes. And uh, whenever you have questions, just ask them and uh, start typing away. So RD tool, I'm, I'm going to sort of start from the beginning. RD tool is a database, round robin database. Um, most people these days associate databases with either something SQL-like, MySQL or PostgreSQL or SQL Server, or if they're very hip, they think of a NoSQL database, and then there are also other databases, like OkDB or Round Robin database. Uh, the main motivation for creating another database was that I wanted to store time series data, while all the other databases are geared towards storing any data. RD tool is very na is very narrow minded. It can only store time series data. But then again, because it limits itself to this topic, it can do some stuff to the data which other databases wouldn't dare to do. Um, and the main thing RD tool does to the data is that it doesn't store the data you hand to it, but rather it resamples the data for you and then stores the resampled version of the data. And that's sort of the, the core thing RD tool does, which might, uh, or sometimes frightens people when they discover it. So you have that system, OpenNMS, for example, which goes out to your devices and gathers information about the traffic on your router or the temperature in your server room. And it does that 
on a schedule. So he goes there every five minutes or every two minutes to speak for that photo. Now, in reality, you don't make the chat for every five minutes. It just goes in waves, and some device doesn't respond, some push doesn't work. The query might even be lost on the network and not happen. You have to move by. The effect is that data arrives roughly every five minutes, but not exactly. And so what RDP does is it takes this data and knows that you intended to store one data point every five minutes. It takes the actual arrival time of the data and then integrates the space underneath the perf, which is built by all the arrival times of the data and creates new points in time which fit to that interval you set when you created the database. And that new data represents the same space underneath the perf as the, the original perf. So this means if you're accounting for traffic, the amount of traffic represented by the newly resampled data point will be exactly the same amount of traffic which is represented by the original data point. But if you look at the numbers, the numbers will be different. The numbers stored in the database. So if your data point was sampled at three minutes of the hour, but you're storing one sample every five minutes, then the storing will happen at the hour and five minutes past the hour and 10 minutes past the hour. So that sample which is arriving at three minutes past the hour can't go into the database. So it has to be readjusted into the right slot. And that, while it does that readjustment, it also changes the value so that the new value still represents the same space underneath the perf. I have some image here. this talk, uh, I'll go to code rather quickly. So you'll always see how things are done. And as we were talking about RDP, the database, you have to create that. Otherwise, you can't store data anywhere. So when you create a database in the SQL world, you have to tell SQL database, what columns you want, what type of data you want to store in each column, stuff like that, which tables. In RDP, each table set is stored in a separate file. So a file represents one table. Each table can contain multiple columns, which is nice. <coughs> so this little script here is done so that it would use RDP from a different installation. The idea here is that if you compile your own copy of the code, that you could execute it from that. But if you don't have it installed here, then it would just be a normal installation of RDP. By the way, all these scripts, if you find them also on this uh, website address I gave earlier, they're stored in subdirectories there, so that you can try them out. So what this does is it creates an RD database. And that RD database is called perf, L And the database has a base interval of 300 seconds. This means RDP will resample all the data. You'll feed into that database through a 300 second interval. You can feed data as quickly as you want in one second intervals if you like to. But the data will get resampled through 300 seconds on storage. So it, it will only store things every 300 seconds. <coughs> but it will take all the input you give to RDP into account, which could not be stored in this case. And I also tell RDP when it should start the database. So that's the first point in time when RDP will accept data into its database. If, so if you try to store data earlier, RDP will tell you, no, uh, sorry, uh, I'm already ahead of you. You can't have data now. 
the data. RDP doesn't accept data points. So whenever you input new data, it'll take the last data, which is four, and your new data, and then fill in the gap between those two points. And when you later on try to feed him something from earlier in time, he'll say, no, uh, sorry, I'm already here. You can't go back in time. Now, the next one, the next element, uh, the next element on the command line is the data source. So that's, uh, it's equivalent to a column in a SQL database. Data source represents where I'm getting my data from. And I'm telling RDP something about the nature of the data I'm going to store. Now, it's always time series data and it's always floating point data. So it, it, uh, the data type internally is always the same. But by defining a data source, you can give RDP some information about the nature of the data. So what I'm doing here is I'm telling it that it's going to be called temperature. So whenever I refer to that data, to that column, I can refer to it by name, implementing a temperature. And then I'm also telling it that is a Gauss type data. So that means <coughs> a thermometer always gives me a number which stands alone. So if I read the thermometer every two seconds or every five minutes, I always get a temperature. And it doesn't matter what the last temperature was. It's just always a piece of information which stands on its own. Whereas if I'm looking at the router and I'm reading the traffic of the router interface, it doesn't tell me I'm running at 10 megabits per second. No, it tells me, oh, I transferred it 700,532 bits or octets. And then when I ask it next time, it tells me, ah, I transferred it 800,763 octets. And then I have to know what it told me last time and create a difference between these two readings in order to figure out how fast it was in doing that. And RDP can do that for me if I tell him that the data source is not Gauss, it's by telling RDP that it's a counter data source, it'll know that every time I'm feeding it a number, it has to create a difference between the last feeding, the last number, and the next one. And then take the time into account in order to arrive at the uh, rate of data transmission. I can also tell RDP how often I insist on updating this data source. So what we have here is that I tell RDP, I only um, accept data if it's arriving within 600 seconds of the last update. So while the RDP database is running at 300 second intervals, so it, we store something every 300 seconds, two competitive readings from the outside world may be up to 600 seconds apart. If they're further apart, then RDP says, sorry, um, that data is not good enough. I can't still reliably create a difference between those two readings because something might ha may have happened in between and I can't work with it. It was not good enough. So obviously to calculate the difference, but the confidence in its validity is too low. So <coughs> by saying that, RDP will automatically reject any input which arrives more than 600 seconds after the last one. It'll do that silently. So all these rules you define for the data source, they'll be applied, but RDP will not complain if you try to input data which is not compliant with the rules. So you won't get flooded with error messages or anything like that. It'll just um, store an unknown value in the database. if you mean if it's more than 10 minutes or if it's less than 10 minutes? 
get one number now. Uh, it is actually, if I, if I pull a number now and then another one in five minutes, then are these two rubles different between those two numbers and the difference between the timestamps and calculate the rate and store that now? That's five minutes. The point is, if you get one now, and then you don't get one for 10 minutes, and you get one at 11 minutes, and you, you give it to RD2, and he says, oh, it's more than 10 minutes since the last update. And you say, okay, so for those 10 minutes, I don't know what the traffic was, and store the unknown in this array. So he calculates the difference, and he says, it's no good. I can't do anything with it, because you told him that it, it has to stop at 10 minutes. So if you're past 10 minutes with your update, it will keep it and not store the array. And it will not store a zero, it will store unknown, which is different. So we'll get into that some more. It knows about the difference between zero and unknown, sort of similar to a SQL database which knows about null and an empty string or zero. So you take those three different things. and Unknown is very, it brings a lot of problems, so to speak. The last two items when I'm defining a data source are presenting a lower and upper boundary for the data, for the rate of the data. So if I know that my router interface can transport between zero and one gigabyte or one gigabit, data, so I set my limit to zero to one gigabit divided by eight, because it offsets on the router interface like this, and then RD2 will make sure that the data which is coming in actually complies with these rules, and if it's outside, well, again, there are some problems. So if I'm looking at the temperature, as in this example, I set it to minus 40, between minus 40 and 100. So I can be sure, or I'm pretty sure that in my server room, the temperature will never be under minus 40 degrees Celsius and over 100 degrees Celsius. I might even narrow it down a little, but that's just sort of safety margin. If it's outside that, then maybe my temperature sensor is picking up that blue wires and uh, I don't want to store that data in my database in case it gets spiked or the system goes down. So I'd rather store it in my server. <coughs> now, with the data source defined, RD2 is now able to receive data. I haven't told RD2 yet how I want it to do it. I told it that I, I want to resample the data at 300 second intervals, but nothing about storing it. The database is called round robin database for a reason. And the reason is that it doesn't store data as normal databases do sequentially into an epic rowing file or file structure, RD2 sets up a file as a curated database, and that file already has enough space to store all the data you ever want to store in that database. And these space, this space for storing the data is called a round robin archive actually have several of those round robin archives and the round robin archives have the special properties of jumping back to their beginning when you're when you're in CM so you set up an archive you say tell RD2 I want an archive which stores my five minute data for a day so RD2 calculates um, by uh, how much space it needs for that and allocates that space in the file and then every five minutes it will store one item into that archive, and when it's at the end of the day, it comes to the beginning and starts overwriting the old items in the archive. Very simple. <coughs> so what I'm doing here, I'm telling RD2 that I'm storing on every round, so every five minutes, one item, and I'm doing that for, fi for five entries per time, very simple very small round robin archive and what it will do is it will only store um, five times five minutes so it will store 25 minutes worth of data 
and this guy here, 0 0.4, well, but at least 0 0.4 or 40% of the data has to be valid in order to go into the RPC. And that's where the unknown comes into play. So if you're storing data into RDC and part of the data is unknown, RDC will track that amount of unknownness of your data and will only store data if a certain amount of the data is valid and unknown. Otherwise, it will store unknown into the archive. Now, if you sample your data every week, you do that on a lot of devices, you're bound to have assemble a lot of data and it is the source or if you're using RDC even creating the data source for that data will already be in here so the question is how long do you want to keep the data that one week data you ha RDC makes you decide at the source so how, how long you want to store that data and oftentimes those systems which use RDC decide for you. They may offer an, uh, an option to say, do you want it? But oftentimes they choose for you. I don't know, how is it with open systems? Anyone know? Open NMS uses RDC, I know. <laughs> and somehow it configures it uh, to store the data. And <laughs> But you might want to look at that uh, after this presentation. So um, if you have people at your, at your site who come to you and say, tell you, uh, in December we had that network problem. Let's look at uh, December 12th morning between 10 and 10.15. How was the traffic on that router? Have you, have you ever tried that with Open NMS? And what does it show on the screen? Does it work? And if, if they come to you and tell you, uh, I need to know from um, December 2011 between uh, 11.13 and uh, 12.30, does it also work? Okay, but then they want to see the spike, the spike in traffic. December 2011 then because it's just sort of blocky data and so that's RDC doing that and the way RDC copes with the, the huge amount of data you should or you you're collecting is that it allows you to consolidate the data and have it all in one place and you're doing that by creating those round robin archives so my first guy here actually stores every sample, every piece of information is stored in one sample in his archive. The second archive stores one sample every three sample. And what that means is, uh, uh, sorry, fourth guy, uh, is it's consolidating three samples into one and then stores it. And that's why if you're looking at 2011, you may still have data, but it's actually in large blocks. Whereas if you're looking at December 2012, you still have the high resolution data. <coughs> and you can tune that. And there is no performance penalty in uh, storing data, even if you set up an archive which covers 10 years at uh, five second intervals, like the situation here. Actually, have a log file, but RDC is fine with that. The problem is then if you want to generate a graph covering the 10 years and you have only stored uh, one minute intervals in that huge RD round robin archive, then RDC would have to read in the 10 years and bunch the data up into one graph, which might take some time because the file might be rather large. 
Well, no, it's a slightly weak link. It, it, people would actually say it's through this side trade block, which pulls through a lot of data. But anyway, what you can do is you create a session branch on the outside at the lower level rate function. So as RDC is updating internal data structures, it is continually also updates a consolidated data structure data. So when you're changing a graph for 10 years, it will not pick the data from that one minute interval, it will also go to the other archive which stores data in one day interval, thus saving uh, a lot of calculation. So it will be a factor of 100 faster, let's say. And you can really decide here how that data structure is going to be. There's some default data structure in OpenMF that depending on your site's requirements, you might want to change that a little bit. It's really just a matter of getting the right tool. Hmm? Later on, yeah. But you, obviously if you, if you create hundreds of rounds of an archive in one RG file, then higher performance for updating will also suffer because it have, up, have to update all those different uh, rounds of stuff. But if you create one round of an archive which only updates once a day and stores only daily averages, then this penalty will only apply once a day. So it's not really tough. Except uh, at midnight when all those sites get updated, then your server might uh, get a little bit angry. But then nobody's looking for data in your end, which really seems like it's not that bad. And as RDC archives or consolidated data into, or several samples into one slot in the archive, you have to tell them, or you can tell them, how they should consolidate it. There are di different consolidation uh, functions available in RDC. The most common one is probably average, but you could also use the min or the max function to choose the minimum value and the maximum value. This can also be interesting if you're looking at uh, cases where you want to guarantee a certain round trip time, round trip time. Then you're not interested in the average, interested in the average round trip time, but you're interested in the maximum round trip time. Which even if you have one outlayer, you might not want to have that if you're looking for uh, a soft browser, for example, they're very sensitive to latency or for gaming output, then uh, you might want to try and do a maximum of that and not average of that. So now maximum here means maximum 300 seconds average. RDC will always average your actual data into those 300 second intervals. So even if you have one outlayer within a 300 second interval, you would get the average for the 300 seconds. So if you need to know stuff at the higher resolution, you can do that. You can tell RDC to set its set size at 20 seconds, for example. You could still store averages for five minutes by picking a higher number here and having RDC average those base sets into already aggregated samples which are stored in this RG or into the RA, but then the max is picked at the higher 10 second interval. So as you're creating the RG file, there are already a lot of decisions you're taking regarding the site's end conditions and then later on the facts from your RG file. Once you've created an RD file and computed data, it's very simple. You, you basically say RD tool update and the name of the RD file, and then something like this. So that's a timestamp and unit timestamp. Unit timestamp is the number of seconds in 19 seconds. 
but then uh, you, you give it that number, obviously you're programming it. Uh, and you also give it the numbers to use for the upgrade. And that's the numbers you read in the data set when you originally did it. So it could be the temporal thing is that you're in you're the count is you acquired from your data. of the data is very important. Because RDC will use it to resample the data into its rigid um, set integral. And if you were not giving RDC information out when you applied the data, then there would be triggers. Perhaps the data is maybe drifting acquire the data and then you actually do the RDC. OpenNMS as an engine is, is able to decouple the acquisition of the data and the feeding to RDC of that data. So it's very important in OpenNMS that it stores the acquisition time of the data and doesn't update RDC just by telling it, yeah, use the current time for the upgrade. Because what you could do if you were really simple, you could replace that long number here with the letter N. N meaning now, and then it would take the clock from the computer and just use that for the current time. Incidentally, you could even uh, use high precision time in milliseconds here. So you can put a, a comma and the number of sec uh, milliseconds offset the number of seconds. People doing satellite mapping, for example, seem to work in milliseconds here to prevent the trigger in their uh, mapping of the satellite position. And some guy, I don't know who that is, but he, he contributed a patch to RDC to make it aware of sub-second positions in milliseconds. And therefore, you can now RDC stores its data as a binary file. If you ever looked at the file using an editor or let, you'll notice that it's not dim readable. But what you can do if you want to look into the file is you can look at an XML representation of the file. RDC has a dump function, which actually dumps the RD file into an XML how this structure looks like, and that's really all the information which is stored in the RD file. And there you can see that all the things that you find when you set up the data store are represented here. So there's the step value, there's the name of the data source, the type of the data source, the minimum required typing. There's also something called log update. Whenever you update the RD database, RDC will store the point in time when you updated the data. So that when you update it next time, it can use that information to calculate the time difference in previous updates, and if it's counter, use that to calculate the rate between those two updates. The RoundDB archive has two parts of OpenNMS. In the first part, the preparation mode, it'll store information prior to actually updating the data. So let's assume you have a round robin archive which stores data on a particular day. Of course, it should store the daily average. How will the averages actually get created before they put into the data? And the way that happens is that each round robin archive has an associated preparation area in the round robin database where the data is being built up, up to the point in time when the round robin takes place to be updated. So each round robin archive works on its own. It's not dependent on data in any of the other round robin archives. 
have his own preparation area where the waiter sees Bob in stores and prepares, and once he's ready, one eye can be transferred to the long-term storage area. The location of these data storage areas within the file is then so that those ahead of Bob that are really interesting or the static information or all the information that is just for the database can be stored up here. Followed by a live file, that's the area where all the database data preparation area is. So for all the RAM headers outside, the data preparation area are stored in that location and also the location where the data is being resampled into those base sample, base intervals we set up for the database. Meaning that as you're updating the RAM headers database, only this part, this very beginning of the database is being touched. The long RAM heading archive may be holding one year or 10 years worth of data which is new condition and not actually accessed until data has to be written into one of those archives. And even when data has to be written on into the archive, then only those bytes which have to go to this archive are sent to this right data center. Meaning that on a, uh, on a performance side, the blocks which have to be rest on this in order to be updated were closely together at the node level. Basically, the beginning of the file has to be touched. And the rest of the file only has to be touched when the RAM heading archive is set to be stored. So, to recap, RD Tools is a database, like many others, except that RD Tools is optimized for one thing, it doesn't store text or or other data, it only stores time series data. And it does not do time series data. It doesn't store what you feed it, it stores the essence of the data. And you can define what the, how that consolidation actually happens and how it arrives at the end of the data. It does that by creating multiple fixed size rotating data stores. Meaning an RD file, as it's loaded, already has its own data store. And these data stores get stored into different locations, pointers pointing to the right location within the rotating buffer. And every time you update it, it goes down one. And when it's at the end, it comes to the beginning. It starts overwriting the old data. It's a happy way of RAM headers. But it's a bigger monster. And once you set up a system using RD tools, in this state, that is incomplete. It already has data. And you leave it running between nodules that have data. Even when someone else is doing the work, if you're completely full, RD tools will actually continue to run and you just need to open the temporary file and see if it still data and it's in output mode. no data vacuuming or database consolidation run to execute. For SQL databases, they produce to deteriorate data stores. And depending on the setup you're using, there is uh, functions within the SQL language, like for example, PostgreSQL has a vacuum function, which does this sort of take the flux of the tables and it uh, restones the dates. But even vacuuming a database is not as good as dumping the database and restoring the whole database, which is the only way to actually clean the data. RD tools doesn't need that. RD tools, the database does not deteriorate in any way. You can update it for years. It will always be in the same high quality, pristine, original state, standard as it was in the initial creation. And the reason for this is that RD tools puts those strong or hard 
rules and the data, it doesn't store your data, it stores the parent's version of the data by recapturing that data. And that drives this very predictability, but it costs offsets to have recaptured data when your system is good running for long periods of time. Here's an example of what happens when data is arriving at an irregular interval. So that database, and as I said, that code is all available in the um, So we're creating a database at the 300 second interval. And now these updates we're seeding, they're not at 300 seconds. They're actually at sort of on the hour, and then 150 seconds later, 310 seconds later, 640 seconds later, and 910 seconds later. Rather irregular, but you know, it could happen. So uh, this data here has an interesting property. I'm always seeding the same number as the, the last part of the time. So what curve would you create it with? So I can say three. The point in time correlates with the number I'm seeding. And I'm doing that to test what are these results of my data. Because the, the point at 300 seconds interval stays put again beyond that line, giving me the equal number. I'm using a count function. So it's not actually a line like this, it's a line like this. If the rate of increase between two consecutive readings is always the number of seconds that I'm seeding. So the rate is actually called the origin rate or the duration of the rate, or rather So I'm doing all these updates, and then there's a command called RDP set, which lets me pull data off the random archive and uh, have it displayed. On fetching, I have to tell RDP set to stop and to stop, and what kind of allegation am I trying to create? By specifying an allegation set, RDP will only look at one of the archives of that kind of allegation. And then it pulls the data. The 300 second interval is the quality here where because in the fourth interval in a fetch operation I have a fetch, it changes the quality of the data to pick data at different interval from the one above. But it always give you data which covers or data from around the Robin archive which is actually covering that range here at the best resolution available, higher than the resolution you expect to see. This makes it incredibly finicky. If you're going for a one minute resolution, two years back, but there's no Land Robin Archive database which actually covers that resolution, then it will just pick at a, a lower resolution back then. But as you go closer to the present, suddenly there is an R RA with the proper resolution and then it will go to that higher resolution RA which is not there. And that's what's happening when you're working with an interactive graphics layer where you can move around in time and suddenly the data goes blocky. Land Robin, uh, the, the graphics layer don't actually know about the fact that the Land Robin archives are available at a relatively high resolution. By using that fetch function internally, it'll just pull through to 
another round of test projects actually before the end of next year. And so we still have some stuff we're working on. And as you can see here, the data is ended up in the round of March projects, is at zero point seven percent. It's very close to zero, which means that the data rate, even though those measurements were all over the time the time space, didn't matter partly to the route to arrive to the station and to the hospital, quite a high proportion of that data is represents the rate of traffic in that line. So if you do billing using this, it gets much higher. That was one of the reasons for the design of RDP to be so vigilant about that. There's a competitor out there called Graphite. Do you know Graphite? Great tool for this exact theory, graph coordinate theory. It actually updates data in time. Uh, you just uh, open a software called the graph and send this data, and it stores it, automatically converts uh, new databases on the fly. You just give this data for a non-existing database and it will pop one up for you. Very user friendly. Although the guy building Graphite doesn't, don't seem to have such a high regard for database systems. And he might have a case because when I looked at the, the system, what they were doing was not that they were resampling the data. They were just looking at Okay, the data has arrived from that um, interval. Is the data from that time interval or not? So if you're looking at five minute interval and you see this data, you say, hey, it's seven past the hour. Okay, it goes into the 10 past interval slot and, and updates the database in that way. And then you immediately send it another update and it looks at the, at this watch says, oh, it's uh, eight minutes past the hour. Okay, yeah, again, in the 10 minutes past the hour slot, overwriting your previous update, which makes it very convenient because you can also go back in time and it's, okay, it's five minutes before the hour. Okay, update that slot. But precision, no. So it's more a tool for, for getting, um, for looking at performance and stuff like that. So if you do billing, you probably shouldn't do graphite. But if you want to actually see the real data, graphite has some nice features and it is very user friendly and very convenient for also getting to weather stations which are nearby. I don't believe this software writes by heart. They have an article on their, on their website where they bash RDP about not being able to do stuff, which is also not true. I have no idea. They never talk to me. I, I don't know how they arrived at those There's a, a sort of a uh, metaphysical problem with uh, beams. So the beams, um, they're, they're always on the dot. So it's at uh, on the hour, five minutes past the hour, 10 minutes past the hour, 15 minutes past the hour. So the, the timestamp on that data storage bin is five minutes past five. But what data does it really look at? Because the rate, is not valid for a point in time. The rate is valid for an interval. Do you agree? So um, now, when I'm storing that information at five minutes past the hour, what interval should it be valid for? Now, we can say it should be valid for five minutes for the time between five minutes and ten minutes past the hour for the for the next interval. I'm telling you. At five minutes past the hour, there was uh, was the data sitting for the next five minutes. But check that five minutes past the hour, I don't know what the data will be because it hasn't happened yet. So I can't store it in that way. So I decided to always store past the hour. So after I've acquired the data, I'm then going to store it. Now, the other question is, is the data for five minutes past the hour still 
disease, or is the vitamin is kicked, sort of, is that still within the interval, or is it fixed up to the interval and already past part of the next interval? And there, the idea was that there is some time that is required to process the data and store the data. So it can't really be that at five minutes past the hour, I already know the data for, for five minutes. So it's a matter of that point in time. So up to sort of a mini, mini micro nano sensor assay session before the five minutes when we act. And at five minutes, all, everything is prepared and stored. And so by asking it, data until 899 and telling it, yeah, I know, if I ask you for until 900, then you'll give me the next interval because 900 is definitely already part of the next interval. Okay. <laughs> Makes your brain hurt. But uh, you have to think about this once and one, once you've understood it, it sort of works out. sort of SLs out. There's a performance penalty when you do that because it has to, there's a performance penalty when you do that because you have to start up R2 every time, which for SET, you don't make such a big difference because R2 uh, will be passed by the LS and therefore starting it up will not be a problem. But if you use an R2 graph, sorry, I can't read that again, it uses a quant counter quant version to sit on quant. And quant counter does lots of passing of quant information to optimize its performance. So if you create a new graph and uh, you have to write a new graph, R2 will employ quant counters and Tango and all those other libraries to, to actually do the quant, the right quant. And as it's doing that the first time, it'll all sorts of passing go on. And then R2 ends and all the passes get completely dropped. And you start R2 again for the next graph and then it does all the passing again and you would be ready to do another graph except there's no way on the command line to do another graph and so everything's lost again. On the other hand, if you're using R2 from a different language where it's loaded up with more libraries, then the first graph will take some time to do all the passing and then the next graph will be much faster because all the passing is done. Now, if you're on the command line, obviously you, you, you're sort of in a bind, you can't do that. But there is a way out. What you can do is you can start RD2 with just a batch of these tokens. And then it'll go into time counter. And if you don't know, there is a, a Java implementation of SLA and RD2 and type SNAP done by Jason Kaiser and Jason Kirk and Jason Garcia. I don't, I don't think it's widely publicized, but he posted on his GitHub about it on the SNP dev channel a mailing list maybe a year back or something. He's on Facebook, so if you're interested in that. Anyway, the, the way the pipe node works is that RD2 uh, acts as a little server, receiving six commands. So you, you give it command line instructions like this, but you'll keep running. You'll give it command line and then new line and then you'll execute that and do whatever, build a graph or spit out that information and then wait for things to come back. And so by hooking it up with a, um, with a pipe and receiving its output and sending out and sending you instructions for the time being, you can keep it running and therefore uh, use all the passing and other optimization for the time being as it tells you. On the on the command line, if you're quick writing a script, you can also use that by writing your instructions into a, into a temporary file and then typing the file into RD2 command line. And then it will also execute all those commands. There's a 
this is hell, which is the sea down there in the ocean. They don't allow you to be green when you want to be green. But then when you have those complex structures that we see in Plato, uh, are you seen on the outside of things or the inward things? So you can have a single color light that can now block a single line of water from the black and that will block the light. optimize your plant body in Plato. When you upload your plant body database, you have to open a file and then do some calculations and then write the block to this. Okay, so now it's like that. Now, writing blocks of data to this is costly. Therefore, you might want not to do that. One way of minimizing that is having multiple data sources in one plant body database. So multiple columns in your database. It can be done, no problem, if you have multiple DF instructions in your creation database and you then are able to restore those uh, to each other. But if you do that, then in every update, you have to give any two data so all those data sources which are stored in those plant body databases. So that is only suitable for data sources which are required at the same time. So if you have that sensor in your server room which measures the temperature and the humidity and uh, I don't know, the amount of smoke or whatever, and you only set those three types of data at the same time, then it will try to create a plant body database which stores those three types, those three lines at the same time, because you're, al you're always requiring a data set to be sensor in order to do that. And whenever you do an update, the update will stay the same. And it will be almost as fast as when you set up the uh, plant body database. But you have to know that that's what you want to do. But for routers as well, routers have always a huge number of counters in there, and you can acquire many, of many counters at the same time. If you're not so sure if that's things you want to double, then you should be storing in one IP plant because there are not any good tools in the basic IE setup which let you <coughs> reconfigure an IP plant. So you actually have to make the right decisions at the start and stay with that. Obviously, you could use RDC dump and then modify the XML and do an RDC restore from the XML and create a new version of the RD plant. There's actually a tool out there which I wrote called RD Shift, which lets you feed a new RD file with data from an old plant, allowing you to re-modify, to modify the whole structure of the RD plant and then the database re-enters as if it were creating it first. whether you store one second intervals for 10 years or one second intervals for five days, the update doesn't change that much. So what do you say? No? Okay. Archives together, and RDC 
doesn't have to update AV1, but sure, every time you take an update, then those four round robin archives will be stored sequentially on disk, and the disk head has to move to four different locations to update those round robin archives. So that will, in fact, will affect the security. data which is always the same, like in my example it's always one, then it could be very complex. So if it's really a random data, then it will not be complex at all. There is no, okay, the Yarden file formats the data, but there is no space in the set. Like if you have uh, always uh, integer numbers, then the binary representation is in a um, eight byte double will be similar to that. So there might be some way to compress that, but there is no uh, empty space in, in that data. So it will be sure if you store it with random data it's always the same, but you can have some space. Mm -hmm. Like CFS for example. Although I wonder I haven't decided for CFS because of CFS always storing, uh, doing its, its copy on write. Uh, I don't know how well that deals with Arden full update because of the, the data would get big by, uh, yeah, by, by CFS. So I haven't tried it. I don't know how it performs in that case. Okay, ah, there is, there is another in-depth view on, on that topic, so I will have another look. So I'm creating an RD file with two round robin archives. One has two entries at the end of every file, and the second one is storing one entry at every single file. So the 678 here is second, and the 378 here will be first and so on. First, I'm pulling data for the 378, and here you will see the the range I'm specifying. And now I'm specifying that I want data starting at 607 and ending at 900. And since 900 is not part of the first integer, I guess the session is reading a set that. I don't really use that session span, but the 900 point is already part of the next integer. Um, and then the second request is to get a longer period of data. Now, the longer period of data is not covered by either of those first one is what is not covered. This file here only stores two data points at 307. So it will end at 607. So it's short. So there's only two storage spaces. Whereas the second round of an archive has three storage spaces at 608. So if I'm testing for 900 points, then only the low resolution round of an archive can cover that amount. And as you can see, Arden Stream will give me the data, but it's coming not from my intended 300 point resolution round of an archive, but from the lower resolution round of an archive. There used to be a, um, a peculiar a peculiar peculiarity in Arden Stream that it made sure that the data range was completely covered by the round robin archive and it didn't look at the other ones. And it didn't only look at the time and the path, it also looked at the time and the setup. And so <coughs> if you have uh, a setup where those round robin archives didn't align at point 307, 
then it could happen that if you pass the Kelvin free test, you set the data from now to, I don't know, half an hour in the past, that you would get data from a low resolution groundbreaking archive because that was already updated, whereas the high resolution archive was not yet updated because the half hour interval of the low resolution was better than the three minute interval or the, the four minute interval of the high resolution archive. Do you imagine? There's a second one storing data at the low resolution. Okay. Now, that just happened yesterday to start with. And now they're getting updated. The 30 minute interval already has happened, and so this guy here has been updated, whereas the four minute interval hasn't happened yet, and so this high resolution archive hasn't been updated. So then what you have is an addition. So if I'm passing the test now to give me data that that interval, there would be a very fancy set of data sets that are then better because that guy is not actually covering the whole uh, test. Oops, okay, sorry. But I only realized that about uh, after about eight years. And so if you're, if you're using a recent version of RD tool, it doesn't look that impressive because all the round-robin archives will do their best to update the data as it goes. They only look at the past. system which, would you, which you're using is not taking this into account, it may happen that when you're looking at graphs that suddenly they go into block mode, even though there you know that there is a high resolution version of the data available, but for some reason the graph is displaying blocky data from some low resolution ground breaking archive, and that's the reason why this is happening. So if you take into account the data set that doesn't really fit this regard, it fits with a disregard of your request and your pitch. So the end point in time, if it's disregarded, then pitching is allowed. So in 1.3, Set data which is outside the public time range. And it will comply, no problem, except that all the data you get is not unknown. And unknown data is represented by method number one. So your chart, which you're drawing the chart, and if you do the test in the right time, you get some unknown data. still 15 minutes to go. Great. So I'll, I'll let you sit down. <coughs> Where do we have to start with all of this? If for some people, the only reason they use RD2, they don't actually store their data in RD2. They create RD files on the fly out of a database and then use RD graphs to create a graph. That happens. There are 
someone attributed a finding to a tissue, the PGR rivals the PLTC. So if you're using RDC 1.4, you can compile it so that you can capture data from a tissue data compiler. If you're doing the read sampling on the fly, then it's done. And it's just easier to keep wrapping. There are better ways than creating a read sample for a data compiler. RDC graph instructions are maybe the longest command line uh, things you can see in the Unix world. And before we, we look at details, let me give you the, uh, the idea or the design idea behind the command line language of RDC graph. There's two kinds of instructions. There are options, they start with a C binary, or a one binary, or a dot binary, and they can be pl played anywhere on the command line, and they affect the whole operation of RDC graph. So they modify the graph size, for example, they modify <coughs> the color of some component of the graph, they define uh, when the graph should start, when it should end, stuff like that. And then there are instructions which do certain things for the graph. So there's a line instruction which actually pays the line of the graph. And they don't start with that bit until sufficiently deep that it's relevant. So things happen in that order. So these instructions are like in a program you send it to RDC graph and RDC graph does it. <coughs> so we're, we're now going to see many more graphs. Bulldoze graphs, you're seeing here, they're graphs in a simpler form. So if you're running a multiple graph in a, in a presentation, you might want to use RDC DLC to output its graph, not only on the CMD file, but also on the CMD file. Or if you're running a presentation like this in front of a, a PDF file, it can be imported into Bulldoze graphs. And if if the program I'm using is DLC, it will be done. And the advantage of uh, using PDF presentations is much higher and it's much better in presentation form if you can make it fit into a PDF file. <coughs> so the first instruction you have to know when you're creating a chart is the def instruction define instruction which defines a variable which you can then use to draw a line. And the variable accesses some data out of an RDC graph. So it's sort of a compressed def instruction. So here I'm telling RDC graph that I want to send a line file of RD and I want it from the data source A whose data source is not a graph. RDC graph is used to fetch, to pull, and round robin archive pseudo graphic data. Resolution and time range, that will be supplied automatically because that can be calculated from the information at a point in time that you store in the graph. So RDC will always try to get data which is the same resolution as the number of pixels which lies across the graph. So each pixel ideally should represent one data point in the graph of archive. Obviously, often there are more than one data point per one pixel, but al it might also be that there's less. So here, in this case, there's fewer data points than pixels, and therefore you get that cross-shading 
other school required that it be funded by the New York State Board of Education. It's not very okay. Let's let's say this grant represents the faculty morale. Would that be a good grant? Didn't start at zero, so I'm not very impressed. Okay, we this guy is also pretty cool. Um, if you're if you want to represent the actual amount of data, and you should start at zero so that it's visible. If you're interested in representing the age of the data, the Dow trailing earns 0.5 percent of the S curve. You you want to start at that, then you shouldn't start at zero. Otherwise, you wouldn't see you you'd be missing all of the facts. But if you want to show that the the, the Dow Trailing is the Dow Trailing Street is now at fifteen thousand and it has been at ten thousand a year ago, then you wouldn't need to necessarily start at zero because it actually represents that good amount of the curve. And you can easily do that by telling all these things at the lower limit that you start with zero. And it's only going to start with zero. As you can see here, the numbers on the vertical axis are are very close to one another. Are these two uh, tries very hard to come up with sensible numbers on those lines. If you look at other private schools, you notice that they don't care. They just say, okay, that tells me ten lines vertically and uh, then you end up with some fancy random numbers that have random about ten numbers that are sitting there and, and they don't make that much sense. And, and so RD2 tries to figure out the scaling so that you end up with the analogy of the valley that that's what the kind of numbers I want to see. And, and so they that's what they get. And it can do that regardless at what scale you're operating at. RD2 graph gives you a lot of options to experiment with these and to take tight control of how this uh, presentation is rendered. But if you don't experiment with them, if you don't take control, then it will try to lead you to the wrong place. And that's why, in this case, I didn't specify anything except for the lower limit, and obviously the interpreter can push the data in broad lines, but I didn't try to hide the amount of scaling that happens there. If you're uh, not so happy with those vertical lines, there's an option called float mode, which causes the staircases to be sort of filed off a little. Still float a little, but they're a little bit more uh, straight. Um, RD2 1.0 used a different graphing library, which wasn't capable of doing non-trivial things. It used the DB library, and therefore the graph created with uh, RD2 1.0 came out of it with this um, current graph. And if you're uh, really, f if you were really fond of that look, with RD2 1.0 there's this option to graph render mode mono, which causes the lines on the graph to go back to that lofty um, DB library. Also with the font. If you want to make the font look like in an 80s computer game, you can do that by switching font cell numbers. Obviously, it's not only a font, it's a PNG version of the font. And if you create PDF versions, you get extra anyway, so there's certainly no problem with that. 
The instruction for drawing lines takes a number after the width of the line that you draw. So here I'm drawing two lines, and the second line, the width is zero, so therefore it's easier to visualize, looking a little bit heavier. Now, as you're drawing graphs, or as you're designing graphs, even though you're maybe a very technical person, there is a little bit of design coming into play and you have to consider the people who are going to look at that graph as well. Now it's technical. And there are also very simple practical things like if you pick a bright color like yellow and a darker one, then if they're both <coughs> one pixel wide, the yellow color will tend to sort of disappear into the background. So while you might not want to make four pixels wide, you might want to make the, the yellow color a little bit brighter than the darker color in order to cause it to have the same optical weight. You can also use line widths which are less than one pixel so you can have a line with a width of two or three pages. And because of the anti-aliasing, thing, it would then become a little lighter causing the viewer to get the impression that that line is actually thinner than one pixel. <coughs> RDC 1.4 also introduces the uh, concept of main typing. So you have these line instructions, and then after the name of the data source, you have color of the line and an additional argument for what the caption is. further arguments specifying like background for example. So here I'm specifying that the line shouldn't be a straight line, it should be interrupted so that it's flat. Now these flashes I told you were really ugly just to show you what it can be for a graph. So if you put a short flashing into the and you will break and blast the frame for example and that might be a way to actually um, show people that those are two different instructions. The best instructions also support the main argument. And one of those main arguments is the step count. By specifying the step, you can instruct RDC to not pick bright because they don't have the resolution of the graph but rather at some lower resolution. And here I'm telling it to pick data at uh, 1,800 megabytes. What it'll actually do is it will resample the data from the main data source. Two is a zero, and therefore you can actually see that I've got a three in the background. Let me show you your graph in a minute. Okay. Or you can specify the start of the data. <coughs> so normally RDC will check data which covers the graph, which is what the RDC stuff says you need. Except there are also other instructions which let you push data around. And that's what we will see. So here I'm telling RDC that I want to test data that's starting at some other point. 
also RDP degrees to review the data through the required test regions. So here I'm focused on what is shown here. The minimal value has a 100 and uh, 1,800 decibels gain. So it's testing this range of data and then it picks the minimal intervals, uh, the minimal values and plays back. And the green guys look the same except that it picks the max. <coughs> you can see the green and the red lines, they represent a different approach. There's also a command called area, which lets you change an area of data. Coming back to that idea of showing off the amount of chatter you're allowed to have on a server, it might be sensible to represent that as an area and not a hierarchy, because traffic is something big. And so having an area represent that traffic would maybe convey that information more efficiently than just drawing a line or area on the top of some graph. Okay, let's stop here. Uh, we have a 15 minute break. I guess there are refreshments in the uh, in the coffee chaos bar here. Uh, we'll start again at uh, 10.45.